Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Their Own Words podcast. My name is Danny. And my name is Ava. And today we're going to be talking about what it was like to be a young person in late Victorian Britain. Specifically, we're going to be reading from the diary of a young guy called Andrew Tate. And no, it's not the Andrew Tate that you're thinking of. This Andrew Tate was about 15 in uh, 1893 when he decided to start keeping a diary. He grew up in South London and was moving at this time to a new uh, sort of expanding town in the Essex area called Ilford. Andrew's life offers us a pretty interesting glimpse into what it was like to be middle class. The middle class was sort of newly emerging at this time. And uh, while not a part of the aristocracy or the gentry, Andrew's family were fairly well off. His father was a shop owner, and we get an interesting glimpse here through his diary of what it was like to be sort of dependent on your parents and in school, and then he transitions into the world of work. Okay, so we meet Andrew. It's April 29th, 1893, and this is his first entry that we'll be looking at, and he's talking about moving from his childhood home to this new place. Well, he's talking specifically about house hunting at this time. So here goes. The Lark Philosophical Society, of which I have the honor to be captain, this is sort of a club that he's a part of, was wild with grief on hearing of my departure and unanimously decided that as we were going to move, the society would have a blowout. The blowout was to consist of a journey by steamboat to London Bridge to visit the tower and ride on the electric railway. We, that is Barrett, Kipps, my brother and I, started from New Cross at half past two. We reached Greenwich in time for the three o'clock steamer to the Old Swan Pier. The fare was three pence each, and he's actually written 3D here, and a little historical note on old British money. They used D and S to indicate the denomination in writing. D is actually short for denarius or denarium, and it indicates pennies or pence, and S indicates shillings. So three pence, uh, or threepence, is what he paid for the fare. And he goes on to say, The fare was 3D each, and well worth it too, considering that I did not pay it, as Papa paid it for us. Greenwich Hospital looks much better from the river than from the shore. The society sat in the stern and enjoyed itself muchly. A band consisting of a harp and violin played part of the time, and played pretty well, too. Some of the warehouses are very large and massive, the ones on the Surrey side being by far the largest. The Tower Bridge is large and imposing. It will be open sometime this year. The tiles of it are being tiled. It has cost a thumping lot of money already, and I hear that even when it is completed, it will cost a lot more because of the insufficient approaches to it. We nearly ran down a lighter just before getting to it. A lighter being a type of flat bottom barge. I was first on shore when our boat reached the old swan and nearly got my toes scrunched in by the gangplank. Okay, and now I'm skipping ahead a bit here to when he gets to the electric railway. This is sort of the main event of the day. Entered electric railway station at 20 to 6. Went into a room after paying fare to wait, as I thought. Saw no sign of a railway or train. Suddenly, the room begins to move. Barrett explains that it is a lift. Room stops moving. We get out on a platform and see a train in front waiting for us. Very peculiar carriages. Guard shuts the door and only opens it at the stations. The windows are only six inches high. The carriages are lighted by electric light and cushioned luxuriously. A sliding panel in the door bears the name of the station the train stops at next and is changed at each station. We got out at the terminus, Stockwell, and had another go at a lift. The whole journey on the Eastern Railway only cost two pence. May 4th, Thursday. We are now at last in our new house, and I must admit that it is a very nice one. Our cat doesn't understand it at all, and was very wild yesterday. Today, it's disappeared and we can't find it anywhere. I am sorry, because it is such a clever cat, and I like it. I went to Barking today. It's an old town and contains many old houses. However, it is badly built and slummy in some parts. May 13, Saturday. Having admired Wanstead Park, we decided to go there today. On the way, two boys asked us if we would like to join a cricket club. They are getting up. 
We thought we would, and we're going to play on Monday next. May 15. Monday. It has not rained now for ten weeks, and everyone wants rain. The ground is like iron and hisses when water is poured on it. We often mistake clods of earth for bricks and bricks for earth. The cricket match that was proposed on Saturday came off this evening. However, as one of the boys had a football, we played that instead. One of the boys who invited us is called Ned, and I like him the best of the lot. The other's called Bob. There's a boy called North, who's an awful duffer, almost as bad as me. Today, the new station is open for traffic. This is an important day in the history of Ilford. May 16th, Tuesday. Also an important day. Hitherto, there has been no fishmongers in Ilford except for a stall occasionally open for the sale of fried fish. But today, a shop has been opened near the Broadway under a man named Handley. June 7th, Wednesday. Well, things have been so dull that, as this diary is meant to be interesting, I have not given a description of them. The most important event has been the royal wedding on July 6th. We saw the illuminations. There was a great crowd, and it is evident that England will not be a republic for several days yet. There was a fight in the house between some of the Irish members. The Victoria, a great ironclad, sank with great loss of life off Smyrna. And I've been nearly shot. It fell out thusly. I was voyaging to Dagenham and was almost hit by some men out rook shooting. Now we're going to Scotland. It's my grandmother's farm, and I expect to enjoy myself. January 3rd, 1894. We saw a black and white cat sitting on our windowsill. It had been there all day, so Mama took it in. Our old cat has been poisoned, so if no one claims this one, we'll keep it. January 5th. I went this evening to what the Bills describe as the Winter Exhibition. The admission was a tanner, and we lent a lot of curious to the African stall. A tanner, by the way, is sixpence. The phonograph was by far the best I've ever heard. It recited, or phonographed, some words of Mr. Gladstone, and so realistic was it that it seemed as if the grand old man was actually speaking to you in person, and had none of the metallic sound I've observed in the previous ones I've heard, and which is ludicrously like the dialogue of Punch and Judy. There was also a mummified cat, on which I quite expected to find a notice saying that the animal was fed on Tholly's cat condiment, but the notice only said that it was found in the conservative club when it was being done up this year. I can quite believe it. It was probably a stick-in-the-mud conservative itself, who would rather be mummified than move on. Or perhaps the result of the last general election killed it. So when he speaks of Mr. Gladstone, he's talking about the British Prime Minister, Gladstone, who was in office until March 1894. And Punch and Judy is actually a traditional puppet show. It's kind of a slapstick comedy puppet show that was pretty popular at the time. I do not know what Tholly's cat condiment is, but if anyone knows, feel free to let us know. Okay, so we're now skipping ahead a little bit in Andrew's diary to hear about him leaving school and entering the world of work. July 18th, Wednesday. This afternoon, I left school forever. Everyone was happy at the end of term, and opening of the summer holidays. But among the shouting uproarious crew, there was one who with difficulty suppressed the sadness he felt. Mr. Sharp, his teacher, shook hands with me and said he expected he would not lose sight of me altogether. He will not, if I can help it. I suppose I should be very jolly now the summer holidays are here, but I'm not. I'm very silly, I know, but I can't help it. Everything seems to remind me that I have left school. I expected yesterday that when our summer holidays were over, I should have to go up to Mr. Spicer's in Thames Street, whom Papa has spoken to about me, about the beginning of September. So judge of my astonishment when this morning, Mama told me that I was to go there before dinner today. Well, we got here at length, and Ma stopped outside while I went in, for Mr. J. Spicer does not like parents coming with boys when they apply for situations because he finds the parents do all the talking. So I pushed open the swinging door and handed a note, from Papa, to an old man in a smoking cap, who told me to wait a bit, because Mr. James was engaged at present. So I waited in the hall. Meanwhile, the queer old man in the smoking cap said, how that man gets through his work, I don't know. Along with other remarks that were not very complimentary to his employer. 
I gazed at the side of the hall with the row of stained glass windows and the little door behind which I knew the head of the firm was ensconced. I gazed at the clock and at the door as it swinged to and fro when people went out. I did this for at least half an hour, and then the man in the smoking cap took in my letter on top of a great brown paper package into the office, and soon after came out and told me I could go in now. I went through a large office into a smaller one, with a window opening onto the street. In a chair sat a tallish, pleasant-looking gentleman, who told me to sit down, and then asked me whether I knew Latin, shorthand, arithmetic, what I did best, where I went to school, who was the master, where I lived, where Ilford was, when I left school, to which I answered, yesterday afternoon, sir, and he seemed amused. Then he called someone in and asked him where Mr. Somebody was. He said he had gone out to dinner, and so Mr. Spicer gave me a piece of paper and told me to write down my name and address. I did so. Thanks, I think that will do, he said. Wish me a good morning, and I went out. I think I made an impression on him, but of course, nothing is certain. September 4th. The thing is decided, the die is cast, I am now a man of business. Or, I will be tomorrow. I yesterday received a postcard inscribed, Please favor us with a call when you are next this way. As if I went to the city every day. I went this morning to Spicer's in response to the card, and after being directed to the smoking-capped man, whose name I discovered as Marshall, I went to another man, the manager, who inquired if I was Mr. Tate. I said I was, and handed him the card. He asked me one or two questions, and I answered them, and he then said Mr. Albert was engaged, and I would have to wait. A troop of girls went into the stained-glass windowed office, and after that came out, went up, and then downstairs, with someone who was evidently Mr. A. Spicer, then they went out. I waited altogether quite an hour. Then A.S. came back, held a confab with the manager, and then dosed me with a perfect volley of questions. Hearing I lived in Ilford, he asked if I knew the Benares. I was astonished, but answered pretty well. He asked me what church I went to, also if I had learned algebra, Latin, Greek, history, and French. Then he and the manager held another long confab, and he at last went out. A confab, by the way, is an informal private discussion. I called here tomorrow at 9, and said that I would be taken on trial at 6 bob a week. And so, I was appointed. The last bit of British money trivia for you. Bob is a shilling, and a shilling is about 12 pence. September 5th, Andrew's first day at work. At 50 Thames Street is James Spicer & Co.'s place of business and thither at nine o'clock, or rather, before it, I wended my way. I saw the manager first of all, signed my name in the attendance book, and was given some advice to the effect that I should get on as well as I possibly could. And then the manager showed me upstairs, into a very large room, at the end of which he stopped and gave me in charge of another man, called Heslot, whose name is actually pronounced Haylot. This man, with whom I was with all day, was rather glad to see me, as someone else in my department, called Wells, is off on his holidays, and Haylett has been doing double work. I copied out of a tissue-papered book called Letter Book into another called PM. Why, I don't know. Then I had to bunk all over the place, which is of exceeding large size, with notes at different times. At one, we bunked off for an hour for dinner, which I took at the Arcadian restaurant in Queen Street. I did various things in the afternoon, including putting the letters into the letter book, which was done thus. The tissue paper pages were damped, and then the letters laid face down, one on each page, or if they were half sheet, size two. A slip of yellow paper was put in on top of each page of letters. Then, when the letters were used up, the book was put in a press, which transferred part of the writing to the wet pages. Then the letters were taken out, and the book is ready to have the invoices put into the PM book in the morning. September 13th. One day here is very much like another. My duties are very numerous, too numerous to suit me quite, in fact. I attend to all the letters in the evening, orders as well, for our department. I book up all orders in the PM. I attend to all our invoices. 
I take all Mr. Beatty's notes for various departments. Mr. Beatty is Mr. George's secretary, I think, or something of that sort. I also am supposed to manage the railway advices, which I'm afraid I don't do, and look after all the stationery of our department. I also have to occasionally go out, and altogether, I'm sure I do more than Wells, the man next to me. Mr. Hallett has been away with a bad throat since Monday, and as it's stock-taking time, this is pretty rough on us. And that is a bit of what it was like to be a young, middle-class boy in late Victorian England. Now, the editor of this volume from which I'm reading has a little note here which gives us a summary of what Andrew Tate got up to afterward. Andrew's business career continued until after the First World War, when he became a driver in the Army Service Corps. After the war, he and his sister, who's not mentioned in the diary, moved to Birkenhead to look after their stepmother. Andrew became a subkeeper at the Lady Lever Art Gallery and kept up his historical interests as a member of the Lancashire and Cheshire Historical Society. He died in 1969. Okay, so we've heard from Andrew Tate, and now it's time to talk a little bit about some of the things that we heard. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my co-host, Ava, to the show. She's an historian like me. Ava, let's talk about some of the things that we heard in Andrew's diary, some of the interesting events that he bore witness to, some of his everyday regular activities. He adds a dose of humor in some of his entries. He's quite interesting. Yeah, there's so much in these excerpts that you read. I particularly loved the May 13th, 15th and 16 excerpts, uh, which were the ones, they're quite short ones, and it's where he's talking about playing cricket, uh, and then he plays football and talks about his friends, and then he talks about the station opening in Ilford, or by Ilford, and the fishmongers opening in Ilford. Um, and even though these are these are pretty ordinary happenings, uh, but I think they're so interesting because it gives us insight into the life of the middle class and particularly here, the middle class youth. Um, you know, what were, what were leisure activities? What were things that were um, historical moments that were happening for them in their town that maybe, you know, aren't going to make the national news, but they were things that were significant for them. So um, the fish shop, it was significant enough for him to write about. It's the only thing he wrote about that day. So it was obviously a significant moment. And I just think it's just striking how similar he is to people today. You know, there's 100, 130 years between us and him, but they deal with all the same kinds of things. You know, friends, uh, he's talking about all of his friends. He's grumbling about the weather, that it hasn't rained for 10 weeks. He's talking about sports, football and cricket, things that are going on. And so it's just... Um, something that we can still relate to, even though we're, you know, 130 years down the road. Yeah, it's it's quite ordinary, isn't it? Which mm. is, I think that's what's so striking, especially about this era, because people are quite articulate um, and they're writing similar to how maybe we would write today, a little bit more formal perhaps. But mm. sometimes when you look at other primary sources from more ancient eras in history, you don't quite get that same relatability. We sometimes distance ourselves from the past yeah. that way, but... The way he writes about such ordinary things like the weather, like you mentioned, and uh, playing sports with his friends, it just makes him seem like such a regular, ordinary person who you could be friends with if you were living at that time. Mm. Um, that's what I like about getting so close to the primary mm. sources. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's talk about the Tower <clears throat> Bridge because that was really interesting. I mean, he was actually there as it's being constructed, and he, again, talking about ordinary life he mentions it so <clears throat> casually as if this is just a, a normal thing and I mean he has no idea at this time what sort of iconic monument this is mm. going to go on to be right across the world in a especially in a digital age where you see a picture of this and that just screams London to so many people yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the really neat thing about reading that entry for me is that, you know, we have the, the May entries where he's, you know, just talking about the things of ordinary life. And that's one kind of entry. But then you have the entries of these people that lived in this time um, where things were happening that become part of the collective memory of the nation, right? Like Tower Tower Bridge is, a, like you said, it's an iconic um, <clears throat> monument. You see it and you know people think that's London. So it is really cool to see his own uh, view of it. Um, and at the time, like no one would have seen 
any kind of structure of this scale and size before in terms of a bridge. Um, it was the largest and most sophisticated bascule bridge the country had ever seen at the time that it was built. Um, bascule meaning that the sections of the bridge could be lowered and raised. Um, so mm. this was a, a never before seen structure bridge of this, this scale. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's actually neat to notice that uh, Tate writes this in 1893 and he says that the Tower Bridge will be open sometime later this year, but it doesn't actually open until 1894. And so we were kind of chatting outside of the recording, talking about, oh, you know, classic construction projects always being delayed, um, even in Victorian times. But it, it might not have been delayed. There is not, in our research, there was kind of nothing to suggest that there was a delay, um, that perhaps maybe it was just, you know, our friend Andrew Tate being misinformed and that's and I actually quite like that inconsistency I quite like the fact that he said it was going to be opened in 1893 and it wasn't open until 1894 because how many times have we in our regular lives said oh yeah this thing opens next week or it opens next year and it actually we're wrong and we're mm -hmm. misinformed and I think it just speaks to like the authenticity of the fact that this is someone's diary this is someone's account his personal subjective experience and sometimes they write things that are wrong in it um so yeah, I thought that was neat. Yeah, that's cool. That's a, a really cool note. Um, okay, so for our listeners, we'll try and go through some of the interesting things that we picked out in this diary, sort of chronologically. So we'll start with kind of where we started. So we've talked about the Tower Bridge, um, which is quite interesting. Looking further down through the diary, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, by the way, he says, he calls his friend a duffer. That is a stupid person. Mm. Uh, so that's some, <laughs> I think that's still current slang, actually. And then also... Uh, he mentions the names of his friends. And I mean, even in the very beginning, we have Kipps and Barrett. I'm not sure if Kipps is a last name or first name, but kind of a unique name. But later when he meets his new gang of friends, and uh, these are the boys he ends up playing cricket and football with, he talks about North uh, as uh, the name of one of his friends. So if you thought Northwest was the first person called North, uh, Kim and Kanye's kid, uh, you were wrong. Apparently that was a Victorian name also. Yeah, uh, it's funny that you mention Kim and Kanye because I, when you read the name North, I thought that cannot have been a common name. I always think of the Victorian era as very kind of proper and, you know, they have all these kind of like ordinary names. Mm -hmm. So I typed in something like, is was North a Victorian name into Google? And I came up with this article from the Mirror um, called the top 10 oddest Victorian Christian names from friendless to one too many. And the byline is, um, <clears throat> if you think Kim and Kanye calling their child Northwest is bad, imagine being called, that's it, who'd have thought it, Restel, which apparently that whole part is in quotation marks. That was a name. And so the article goes on to talk about this um, London-based genealogy firm that spent more than 40 years compiling this list of really hilarious Victorian names and some of the names include Friendless Baxter, Leicester Railway Cope, Zebra Lines and Time of Day, which you just can't fathom anyone being given names like that. Um, and the funniest part, I think, of the article is there's one girl born in 1882 who was given 26 names by her parents to represent every letter in the alphabet. So yeah, apparently they had some very unique um, weird names in in Victorian times. Yeah, that's, that's so funny because we think of that as a modern phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, we think of Victorian people as being Harry and Agnes yeah. and Edward and James, like mm -hmm. just very, very basic normal names. And Elon Musk, I guess, was not reinventing the wheel by <laughs> just coming up with a super bizarre name for his kid. Yeah. I mean, 26 names for every letter of the alphabet is extremely interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... <clears throat> Ava, you've mentioned the fish stall. You found something pretty interesting about... So he mentions in the diary this new fish stall coming to Ilford being their first sort of uh, fishmonger, mm. he mentions in the diary, I think. Yeah, I just... Uh, as a bit of a kind of a nerd, I guess, I whenever I see in diary entries people referring to places or things like that I always try and look them up and see if they still exist or if there's any record of them so he mentioned like this iconic day for uh for Ilford was when the fishmongers um opened and we couldn't when we were researching we couldn't find the name of the fish shop that Tate refers to um but we did actually manage to find some information about one of the sons of the family that owned the shop because 
Tate mentions the fishmongers in Ilford was opened up um, under the management of a name uh, of a man called uh, Handley. So that was his last name. So I kind of just typed in, you know, fishmongers, Ilford, 1894, Handley or something like that. Um, And I actually found a page on this guy, Arthur Thomas Handley. And I found out that he was a soldier in the First World War who died in 1917 at the age of 23, which would put his birth at around the time of the fish shop opening, because the fish shop opened in in around 1893 when... uh, when Andrew Tate's writing this. Um, And so the research showed that he lived above a fish and poultry shop that his family owned on 7274 High Road, which is, as Tate points out in his diary, when he refers to the fish shop uh, right near the Broadway. So it was just really cool to make that connection that even though I couldn't quite identify the name of the fish shop, um, I could corroborate these historical details that there was this guy who existed, who was the son of um, a fishmonger and lived in the exact location that Tate refers to in his uh, entry. Yeah, and kind of sad, actually, that Mm. this guy would grow up in Ilford, obviously 15 years younger or so than Andrew. And his family came there to start a new life and uh, maybe were fairly successful, we can assume, Mm. um, but died at such a young age in the First World War, which is the case for so many Uh, people born in that late Victorian Mm -hmm. era. So many young men. Okay, I want to say something about the royal wedding. I thought that was quite funny. He's sort of facetious about it, but he makes this comment about the royal wedding, which says, I don't think we're going to be a republic anytime soon, but he's hinting at the fact that there is this sort of republican sentiment brewing in some form or another in the late Victorian era. And it is just hilarious to me. I, I remember reading in another research project about Senate reform in Canada in the 1920s. There was an article in this paper about Senate reform. And it's funny how some of these issues just seem to continuously come up. And yet there's nothing really done about them. So Mm -hmm. even today we're talking, oh, Canada's going to become a republic. We're going to throw off the monarchy. And, And even in the 1890s, this is sort of something he's talking about. But it's always these things, like the royal wedding, which seem to capture people's attention and they seem to enjoy and we move on yeah i think it's just that idea that there's nothing new under the sun really Mm -hmm. we're always dealing with the same kinds of things let's move on to the winter (laughs) exhibition this is one of my favorite excerpts uh actually he's talking about the phonograph so he's heard it before Mm. so imagine somebody listening to a phonograph for the first time i mean we can't we actually can't imagine now i mean you guys are listening to this right now in your headphones or through a speaker somewhere, and it's very normal. We just take it for granted. Yet, uh, now he mentions this isn't the first time he's listened to a phonograph, but the first time would be something completely extraordinary. Like, there's no concept of taking somebody's voice and putting it into a box and somehow projecting it out. I mean, this is totally, totally revolutionary, and now, 150 plus years later, we have audio all around us all the time. So I thought that was really, mm. really neat. And he says that this one was particularly good, this phonograph. Yeah, I do, I do think that that's something that we couldn't possibly, like you said, fathom. It, it's just become so ordinary to us, right? Like, yeah, the fact that we're doing a podcast right now and people can listen to us, it's just so ordinary that we fail to be kind of amazed by technology anymore. But mm-hmm. at this time, it was just something revolutionary that would change their lives. So, yeah, it's Yeah, the Victorian time is a time of immense innovation. I mean, the world is industrializing at a really rapid rate and new inventions are coming out all the time. It's completely changing the world that these people lived in. And Andrew Tate's interesting because he died in 1969. He would have definitely seen this mega transition. Mm -hmm. Not the computer age yet, but still quite a pretty fascinating transition. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next thing I want to talk about, which I thought was quite interesting and kind of funny is uh he's getting his job interview uh he's getting his job and i'm not sure exactly what he did but it sounds like he's essentially a clerk he's not really doing anything too academic or onerous really a lot of uh, working with paper organizing files that kind of a thing the kind of the thing you do in your first internship or first and yet his boss wanted to know if he'd studied latin greek and algebra And I think that's quite similar to today. Like, you need a bachelor's degree just to get your foot in the door in many places, even if all you're doing is shuffling papers around. Mm. 
again, the, that's what I quite like about these diaries of the Victorian era is that, yeah, it is like there are things that were different, but there was also so much that was the same. Um, one of the things that's different that I like is right before he asks about uh, the Latin, Greek and history, Tate records that uh, he says he asked me what church I went to. And I just think that um, it's just such an indication of the fact that Britain was still very much a Christian nation at that point. Like you wouldn't just ask someone today that you just met what church do you go to but it's assumed yeah. back then that you go to church so what church do you go to um and so i just think it's really indicative of uh the social cultural and religious milieu of the time yeah for sure well i think that pretty much close up our conversation on andrew tate yeah um if anybody has any questions comments concerns you can email us at uh their own words pod at gmail.com and we'd love to get your questions, concerns. We will be having an episode at the end of this season where we answer some of your questions. So please feel free to shoot us an email. And thank you all so much for listening. Thanks, guys.